Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the Gospel of Mark. I don't know if you've looked at the Gospel of Mark very carefully recently, but um, this is lesson number six of that series for August 10 of 2024, entitled Inside Out. Hmm. What could that mean? Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you for the revelations that came primarily through the time when your son was here on this earth. And this record we have from Peter speaking to Mark and who wrote it down is an interesting and very important document. Help us to understand it more clearly is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. In this lesson, we will follow Jesus in the final days of his work in Galilee. And I'm going to take just a moment in, in that light to say we have the, the best indication of the, of the four Gospels. The one is, that seems to give us the best timeline is actually the Gospel of John. And you've got to work around it, and the, I won't go into all the details, but... It looks like Jesus went down and was baptized in AD 27. Then he went back to do something in Galilee, you know, to, went to a wedding and so forth. We don't know much about what happened for the next six months. He went to the Passover in Jerusalem, the spring of AD 28. Then, as far as we can tell, there's some evidence that he worked around more or less under the radar in the, in the area of Judea for the next year. At that point in time, um, John the Baptist was arrested. And Jesus said, okay, it's time to start playing it careful here. And so he moved, from, he moved his ministry from Judea, which has been sort of under the radar and we know very little about it. He moved to Galilee. And the Gal the, the, the Three, the three other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, really, except for, the, of course, the last week of Jesus' life in Jerusalem, their main emphasis is, okay, what happened in Galilee? That's their main emphasis. Luke carries quite a bit of time of his work over in Perea, on the other side of the Jordan, and so forth. But now, we're talking about the time when Jesus is about to finish his work in Galilee because... John is going to be beheaded. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. He's working in Galilee. Did I say Judea? Yeah. He's finishing his work in Galilee. As when Jesus, when um, John the Baptist is beheaded, Jesus takes his disciples and he moves out of Galilean territory now into, <clears throat> first of all, to Tyre and Sidon, and then he went over to Caesarea Philippi, and then went back down to. Um, uh, the Decapolis or the Ten Towns area. And then finally, the last uh, half, a, half a year of his, of his ministry, he started really moving through, through even through Samaria and so forth like this. And he's, he, instead of up to that time, he's been kind of trying to play it cool and keeping quiet. But now in the last six months of your life, he's really going to just let everyone know, because he knows when he proceeds to Jerusalem, he wants the whole, as many people as possible, to be watching what happens. Did so he, that's... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Did he know that John the Baptist was going to be beheaded, or he just knew that he was... Like, well, his disciples came to him just about the time Jesus was ready to move out of Galilee, because things were getting difficult in Galilee. The disciples, came, John's disciples came to him and told him that he had been beheaded. Oh, that he had already... Yeah. Been. I think that's Matthew 11, if I'm not mistaken. And um, anyway, so in this lesson, we'll follow Jesus now in the second major part of his ministry. He already knew that the religious leaders in Judea were seeking to kill him. That's John 5, 18 and 7, 2. But he did not hesitate to condemn those religious leaders in a way that clearly showed that he was supporting the Old Testament scriptures while well, they were not. Of course, you can imagine how they felt about, <laughs> about that. They were following their religious tradition over and above the actual scriptures. 
as things were becoming dangerous, Jesus left Galilee and traveled outside of Jew Jewish territory to Tyre and Sidon and healed, healed the daughter of a Canaanite woman. He returned to Galilee by a circuitous route, going all the way to Caesarea Philippi and then into Decapolis where he'd healed a deaf mute man. When the people of Decapolis heard that Jesus was in their territory again, they remembered what they had been told by the one or two possibly a formerly demon-possessed man for, uh, so thousands yeah, wanted to see Jesus for themselves. So that's the sort of picture we're, we're looking at here. Start with Mark 7, Jim. Verses 1 to 13. Some Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They noticed that some of the disciples were eating their food with hands that were ritually unclean. That is, they had not washed them in the way the Pharisees said people should. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't wash your hands in the wrong way. <laughs> Somebody's keeping score and yeah. watching. For the Pharisees, as well as the rest of the Jews, followed the teaching they received from their ancestors. They, did, they do not eat unless they wash their hands in a proper way, nor do they eat anything that comes from the market unless they wash it first. And they follow many other rules which they have received such as the proper way to wash cups, pots, copper bowls, and beds. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why is it that you, excuse me, why is it that your disciples do not follow the teaching handed down by our ancestors, but instead eat with ritually unclean hands? So what's the issue here? We're not talking about what's safety. We're not talking about dirt on the food or anything else. We're talking about ritual uncleanness. Okay, go ahead. And this doesn't mean that they didn't wash their hands in soap and, oh. and hot water for 20 seconds. It means oh. something totally different. Yes. Mm. We're going to get to it. Go ahead, Jim. Jesus answered them, How right Isaiah was when he prophesied about you. You are hypocrites. Just as he wrote, These people say God, says God, honor, me with their words, but their heart is really far away from me. It is no use for them to worship me because they teach human rules as though they were God's laws. You put aside God's commands and obey human teaching. And Jesus continued, you have, excuse me, you have a clever way of rejecting God's law in order to uphold your own teaching. For Moses commanded, respect your father and your mother. Whoever curses his father and his mother is to be put to death. But you teach that if a person has something he could use to help his father or mother, but says, this is Corban, which means it belongs to God, he is excused from helping his father or mother. In this way, the teaching you pass on to others cancels out the word of God. And there are many other things like this that you do. Wow. Okay, does this, I mean, here's the people who claim to be st absolutely strict followers of the scriptures. And Jesus just plainly shows them that they're not doing that. No, I mean, no serious thing is just to follow the rituals and, and mutter the uh, incantations and whatever. <laughs> does not, this? Not much different than a, uh, what a Buddhist, they thought, mm. <laughs> Does this uh, passage have something to do with personal cleanliness? Not at all. So where do these ideas come from? Jennifer. From the Bible study guide, in Jesus' day, many people in that land were very concerned with ritual purity. During the time between the Testaments, the idea of washing hands in order to remain ritually pure was extended to common people, even though these rules originally applied only to the priests in the Old Testament from Exodus 30, verses 17 to 21. It is in keeping with this concept that the religious leaders complain to Jesus about his disciples. So they decided at some point in time that these rules that had been given to the priests to prepare themselves for entering the holy place in, in their ministry, these rules should apply to everybody. And of course, what we're going to find out here is that like what kind of contamination are they worried about? It might have been touched by a Gentile. Oh dear. There's the thought. 
I mean, it might have been touched by one of us. One of us. As Jesus was trying to explain to them, they had expanded the teaching that was designed just for the priests as they carried out their ceremonial activities within the temple precincts to include ritual or ceremonial cleanness for all Jews in all situations. I don't know, of course, how this happened, but I'm suspecting that it probably started out, okay, I'm better than you because I did it a little bit more, and I did it, I'm better than you are, and I did it again a little bit more and a little bit more, and it's probably that's how it gradually built up to this. We all need to do this. They had carried this matter of ritual cleanliness to the extent that after going to the marketplace and purchasing fruits and vegetables, they had to clean both the food and themselves in a special way when they came home for fear that those fruits and vegetables might have been touched by a Gentile mm. and thus made impure according to their teachings. So where did the original idea of ritual cleaning, cleaning, I'm sorry, cleaning come from? From Gordon? Exodus 30, 17 to 21, the Lord said to Moses, make a bronze basin with a bronze base, place it between the tent and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to use the water to wash their hands and feet before they go into the tent or approach the altar to offer the food offering. Then they will not be killed. They must wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is a rule which they and their descendants are to share, are to observe forever in the Good News wow. Bible. So is that, since these are, some of these are descendants of, of the priests of well, Aaron's family, is that why they, what, how they justified it? Okay, well, I mean, that, I'm sure that might be a factor, but of course, this was intended to be a part of the ritual purification before they actually carried out their duties in the temple. Okay. And now they're talking about, and there's nothing about Gentiles in this stuff at all. Yeah. When asked why his disciples were eating without going through the ritual purifications, Jesus did not answer their question directly. He started by quoting Isaiah. And what is it, Isaiah 29, 13? The Lord said, these people claim to worship me, but their words are meaningless and their hearts are somewhere else. Their religion is nothing but human rules and traditions which they have simply memorized. Now, I'm going to have to interrupt there for just a second again. We know that many of these people back in Paul's day and in, in Jesus' day had memorized the entire Old Testament in the original language, in Hebrew. So obviously they, they, they could have quoted this memory verse by, by memory. Okay, so the second part, Jim? Mm. The second part of Jesus' reply plays off the Isaiah quotation. The Lord cites the command of God to honor one's parents. Exodus 20, verse 12. That is, to take care of them in their old age and contrast this with a religious tradition where one could give something to God that is a gift called korban. Use it to, excuse me, use it for oneself, but deny its use to elderly parents in need. One can not, excuse me, one can just imagine the encounter. I am sorry, Father, I would love to help you, but I gave the money to the temple. Yeah. Or, or you could say with it's it being set aside for for the temple. Exactly. It just uh... we don't do anything like that today, do we? No, no, we wouldn't. I'm sure. Okay, you want to take that big verse there, Jennifer? Sure. <laughs> Exodus chapter twenty, verse twelve: Respect your father and your mother, so that you may live a long time in the land that I am giving you. I'm going to use Bible. And Gordon. In the Bible study guide, it is this type of hypocrisy that Jesus attacks uncompromisingly. They have placed human tradition above the word of God and in so doing have sinned. So what was the answer to the Pharisees question? The response of Jesus implies that he does not find convincing their insistence on hand purification as necessary to be in accordance with the will of God. Instead, his response clearly supports the commandments of the law over, over against human tradition. Yes. And mm -hmm. there are a number of references from the Bible study yes. guide. If this and other situations, in this or other situations, 
and other situations. I'm sorry, Jesus repeatedly showed how they were completely wrong because they followed their own traditions instead of following scripture. Is it possible that we have some traditions that might be contradictory to the principles of God's law? Is that even possible? <laughs> It's certainly possible, but Everybody, not us. Not us. Okay. <laughs> Having Other answered the Jewish leaders in a way that they uh, could not refute, Jesus then turned to the other people around and gave this advice. Jim? Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 19. Then Jesus called the crowd to him once more and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing that goes into a person from the outside which can make you, him ritually unclean. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that makes him unclean. Note, some manuscripts add verse 16. Listen then, if you have ears. Okay. Verse four, four, chapter 4, verse 23. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples asked him to explain this saying. You are no more intelligent than the others, Jesus said to them. That seems, like a, that seems like a sort of uh, an unusual way to address them, but go ahead. Uh, you are no more to, Jesus said to them, don't you understand? Nothing that goes into a person from the outside can really make the, him unclean because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and then goes out the, of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared that all foods are fit to be eaten. Now that's, who added that? Yeah. Well, that's, well, at least it's in parentheses. Yes. Uh, I know, that's why I said it was added. It, yeah. was, it was, it was uh, in fact. It would be it, nice to know when that was added to. Yes. So what did these words really mean? And if we had the whole evening, we could discuss the whole story about starting with Acts 15, then going to Romans 8 and 10, and, and then, um, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, and then Romans 14, and we would find all kinds of big, long story. This was argued up and down and back and forth by the early church. So what do these words mean? Really mean? Was Jesus possibly telling us that virtually anything is safe to eat? Is it safe even to eat poison? Absolutely as, not. It borders on the absurd. Uh, as, virtually, oh yeah, <laughs> as virtually all scholars have recognized, this was not a question about what is safe to eat. This is a separate issue Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about uh, foods that were safe or not safe to eat, as is dealt with in places like Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Now, there's rules back there. They aren't always applicable, but at least there's some. That's more about what's safe and what's not safe to eat. Their traditions were supposed to be methods of acquiring human merit or favor in the sight of God and thus helping them to earn salvation. We're all busy earning salvation, right? Well, what the purpose of salvation is for, for eternal life? Yeah. Well, they go to uh, Matthew 19, verses 18 and 19, when the rich man says, what do I have to do to get eternal life? Yeah. And Jesus listed off six things. Yeah. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery, honor your parents, uh, 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 yep. love God, love your fellow man, and don't bear false witness. Six things, and uh, I mean, you don't need to... <laughs> Jesus pointed out clearly that it is not what a person puts into his mouth that has something to do with his salvation, but rather what comes out of his mouth. Okay, Jennifer? In the Bible study guide. First, it would be odd for Jesus suddenly to dismiss Mosaic instructions in Mark 7, chapter, verses 14 to 19, when he had just defended Moses against tradition in Mark 7, verses 6 to 13. Second, the very tradition that the Pharisees were promoting does not have a basis in Old Testament teaching. The food laws, in contrast, do. Third, what Mark 7, 19 means when it says that Jesus cleanses all food is not that the food laws are abolished, but instead that, th that the tradition of touch contamination that the Pharisees had made was invalid. Guess what? <laughs> Go ahead. 
this, for example, is that false notion that if you could be contaminated by coming in contact with Gentiles, then you also could be contaminated through contact with food that they had touched. Wow. And our Bible study guide, yeah. Mm -hmm. What a, <laughs> anyway, Gordon, go ahead. Continuing in Mark 7, starting with verse 20, and he went, went on to say, it is not what comes out of a person that makes him unclean. It is what comes out of a person that makes him unclean. For what, for from the inside, from a person's heart, come the evil ideas which lead him to do immoral things, to rob, kill, commit adultery, be greedy, and do all sorts of evil things, deceit, indecency, jealousy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from inside a person and make him unclean from the Good News Bible. Okay. So now we're getting down here. We're trying to, we're getting it sort of sorted out here, aren't we? Our Bible study guide, guide comes back. When the reference to the fifth commandment in Mark 7, verse 10 is included with the vice list, every commandment of the second table of the Decalogue is there. Further, Jesus refers to vain worship in Mark 7, verse 7, the breaking of what is at the heart of the first four commandments of the Decalogue. Thus, Jesus stands as a defender of the law of God throughout, uh, throughout the passage. So the, all of, of Mark 7 is defend, it basically defends the entire law of God. You might have the right theology, however, who really and ultimately has your heart? That would be the question. When Jesus recognized that the situation in Galilee was becoming contentious and potentially dangerous, which we talked about earlier, he left the territory of Galilee. He then he left not just because of that, but also because he needed time to teach his disciples and also to reach out, reach out to a Canaanite woman whose daughter was possessed by the devil. So here's a question that I want to ask you in that light. Did Jesus know in advance that this woman was over there with a, with a demon-possessed daughter? Well, you suggested in, in your comments just before that you think he did. You think that was a plan. Okay. To go to Tyre and Sidon. Was it? Okay, let's look at that a little bit more. In the area of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus encountered a woman whose daughter was possessed by an evil spirit. And Mark 7, going on with the same chapter. Then Jesus left and went away to the territory near the city of Tyre. He went into a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, but he, wouldn't, he could not stay hidden. Can you imagine staying hidden? A woman whose daughter had an evil spirit in her heard about Jesus and came to him at once and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile born in the region of Phoenicia and Syria. And by the way, if you include the Gospel of Luke, who gives more of those kinds of details. She was a Canaanitish woman. That means she was a descendant of the Canaanite groups that were supposed to have been destroyed by the, the Jews when they entered the land of Canaan way back in Moses' day, or at least Joshua's day. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus answered, let us first feed the children. It isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Sir, she answered, even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers. And if we had, we're reading Greek here, it would you know here that the word she uses for dogs is not the ones that run out in the street. These are dogs that are inside the house and get fed from the table. So Jesus said to her, because of that answer, go back home where you will find that the demon has gone out of your daughter. She went home and found her daughter lying on the bed the demon had indeed gone out of her. And Ellen White's comments, Jim? On the right of Ellen White, Christ knew this woman's situation. He knew that she was longing to see him, and he placed himself in her path. By okay. ministering to her sorrow, he could give a living representation of the, of the lesson he designed to teach. Now let me interrupt for a second. So how do you think Jesus found out about this daughter that was far away in another place? Well, you have suggested many times in the past that Jesus spent hours, if not the whole night, in prayer yep. discussing the situation of what would happen the next day. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do when? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm sure this 
incident was discussed the night before between himself and the father. I don't think you need to have any doubt on that issue. Yeah. Okay, for this, uh, for this he had brought his disciples into the region. So he, he, he's, he's trying to accomplish several things. One of the important things, these really important things he's gonna, we're going to talk about here, other than casting out demons, this is a time when he's going to especially focus on teaching and training his disciples. And we're going to talk about the challenges of that in just a moment. Um, he had brought his disciples into this region. He desired them to see the ignorance existing in cities and villages close to the land of Israel. The people who had been given every opportunity to understand the truth were without a knowledge of the needs of those around them. No effort was made to help souls in darkness. The partition wall which Jewish pride had erected shut even, his, even the disciples from sympathy with the heathen world but these barriers were to be broken down. And how were they to be broken down? As we know in the future history, what actually happened? Well, the gospel went to the Gentiles. And what caused it to go to the Gentiles? Persecution. Persecution. They had to be persecuted. The Christian church had to be persecuted. Initially, it was persecuted by Paul, who later became a Christian evangelist, but you know, initially, it, it had to, the people of Jerusalem, the Christians in Jerusalem, had to be persecuted to, to get scattered to, to, to carry the gospel out. So why did Jesus seem to disrespect and talk down to this Canaanite woman? Who were we? I think, Jennifer, I think that's yours. From the Bible study guide, the story in this passage also raises troubling questions. Why does Jesus respond so harshly to this woman, in so many words calling her a dog? He does not openly explain, but two characteristics in his response to her suggest that he is teaching. In Mark 7, verse 27, he says that the children should be fed, quote, first. If there is a first, it seems logical that there would be a second. The other characteristic is that Jesus uses a diminutive form of the word dog not meaning puppies, but rather, in context, dogs allowed inside the house in contrast to street dogs. The woman picks up on these two markers in her response to Jesus, which help ex helps explain her response. She's paying attention, isn't she? Mm -hmm. She has a desperate need, and so she's paying very close attention. This woman had heard about Jesus, probably from the Jews who lived in the area and were aware of what he had been doing. She realized that Jesus was her last and only hope. So she took advantage of every possible hint that she could find to achieve her goal. Gordon? Or from Ellen White. By his dealings with her, he has shown that she who has been regarded as an outcast from Israel is no longer an alien, but a child of God's household. As a child, it is her privilege to share in the Father's gifts. Let me interrupt for a second. Where is Jesus at this time? Where, where, he said he went into a house. He didn't want, didn't want anybody to know where he, where he was. Who, who do you suppose that house belonged to? Almost certainly a Gentile. Oh dear, you mean he was being contaminated by being in a Gentile's house and he's doing all this stuff? Aren't we still in Tyre or Sidon area? <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah. We are, absolutely. Probably not many Jews living there. Well, there might have been some, but it's not likely that he was in a Jewish house. Go ahead. Continuing, Christ now grants her request and finishes the lesson to the disciples. Turning to her with a look of pity and love, he says, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. From that hour, her daughter became whole. The demon troubled her no more. The woman departed, acknowledging her Savior, and happy in the granting of her, of her prayer. Desire of Ages 401. And you see a link there under that passage. We just might mention that if you go to our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you can download these um, lesson plans that we're, we're discussing. And if you click on that link, it'll take you straight to the original source of that quotation. So where does prejudice against other races, tribes, and nationalities come from? 
isn't it clear in this story that all such prejudices are contrary to Jesus' teachings? Mm. And if we're planning to live for the rest of eternity, surrounded by people from all time periods and all nations, if we have a hard time doing that, maybe we won't be there, huh? Maybe, the time in, maybe we'll change. I think probably the changing, the changing should start happening now. Well, that's what I meant. Yes. Uh, maybe we will change from the way we are currently. Okay. The time had come for Jesus to make his way back to the area on the other east side of the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. He had left that area because of the, in, uh, the incident with a demon-possessed man or men and the 2,000 pigs. They asked him to go, so he left. As soon as he entered that territory, some people recognized him and his capabilities. They immediately asked for help. So once, you know, he's, he, once they know what he can do, grab his help. Okay, Mark 7, moving on in the chapter. Jesus then left the neighborhood of Tyre and went on to Sidon to Lake Galilee, going by way of the territory of the Ten Towns. Some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. So apparently they had some idea of how he would do things already. Um, so Jesus took him off alone, away from the crowd, put his fingers in the man's ears, spat and touched the man's tongue. Then Jesus looked up to heaven, gave a deep groan, and said to the man, Ephatha, which means open up. At once the man was able to hear his speech, impediment was removed, and he began to talk without any trouble. Then Jesus ordered the people not to speak of it to anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they spoke. And all who heard were completely amazed. How well he does everything, they exclaimed. He even causes the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Okay, Jim. What verse? Jesus understands there. Okay, I'm sorry. Jesus understands the man's predicament and takes him aside privately. Jesus' manner of healing, excuse me, healing the man is curious, particularly for modern readers. He puts his fingers in the man's ears, spits, touches his tongue, and sighs. Jesus touches the affected part of the man that he, that he will heal. But why the sigh? Next, the Bible study guide quotes Ellen White as, as below. He sighs at the, at the thought of, of the ears that would not open to the truth, the tongues, to the truth, the tongues that refuse to acknowledge the Redeemer. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 402. So here's a man who can't speak and can't hear. He fixes him, but he can't fix all the people who refuse to recognize him as a redeemer, refuse to hear the truth or to speak of the truth, okay? The Bible study guide invites us to explore this idea further by considering something else. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back a moment now. Do we, what do we know about Jesus' past? He was a creator. He was a creator. So how was Adam created? It formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed his nostrils breath of life and man began to live. Okay. You want to read that from Genesis? Well, Gordon, I guess it's your turn. We just did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. Good news Bible. So this wasn't the first time that Jesus is forming somebody or touching them and making them Mm -hmm. whole, right? Uh, Isaiah 43, 7, they are my people and I created them to bring me glory. And if you remember the passage, the area from Isaiah 40 through uh, 55, it's a very extensive time when God gives, okay, if you want to compare me to these other gods that people are worshiping, here are the criteria. Look at, and of course, the two main things that he talks about in that section is, I created out of nothing, and I predict events that are going to happen far in the future. He says, if you, if you gods think you're, you're some kind of god, try that. 
just, just do some of that. <laughs> See how you do. <laughs> well, uh, that, uh, you could both read into that uh, uh, John 17 verses one and two. Yeah. And the ones you've given me, I, you, you know, they're, they're not, they're not going to leave. They're, they're, yeah. they're, it's a, I, that's a great verse. I think First uh, John. Five is it or five twenty-five or something like four twenty-five, something like this, a similar passage. So Genesis describes the creation of the first man on our planet. The word "formed" comes from the Hebrew uh, verb "shir," which also means fashion, create, or shape from the dictionary of classical Hebrew. The author of Genesis uses this verb to describe the work of a creator who forms or a part who shapes his creation. The tactile image of one who puts his hands on matter in order to shape from it the first human being is undeniable in Genesis. In addition, the following sentence in Genesis 2-7 describes a part of the process that renders the inert materials into living conscious matter. The Lord imparts the breath of life into the clay. That is, he breathes into his, he breathed into his nostrils. <clears throat> Similarly, well, Jim, you want to pick up there? In Mark 7, we have an allusion to the making of Adam. In the case of the deaf man who speaks with difficulty, Mark 7, 32, Jesus intervenes by using his own hands and mouth as a vehicle of healing. In this way, Jesus seeks to reshape, as it were, his creation, which he does by putting his fingers into the man's ears, then he spits and touches the man's tongue with his saliva, and at the command of his word, the man is recreated. In that instant, the man is a new person and his ears were open and the impediment of his tongue was removed and he began speaking plainly, Mark 7, 35. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, thus the creator of the universe has come to earth to restore the creation which Satan has ruined. According to Mark, Jesus has come to start his work of recreation in doing, quote, all things well. There is no doubt such work is the fulfillment of messianic prophecy, once again from Isaiah. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The retribution of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of those who are blind will be opened and the ears of those who are deaf will be unstopped. Then those who limp will leap like a deer, and the tongue of those who cannot speak will shout for joy. Okay. Why did Jesus ask many of the people that he healed to keep quiet about what he had done, especially since we know that he knew in advance that they would not? Isn't that true? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. What traditions are believed and practiced today that are contrary to the scriptures? Do we dare go there? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't. There's certainly Christian holidays, a whole bunch of Christian holidays, which are based only on tradition, not on scripture at all. Just for an example. Well, Jesus took a boat back from the area of Decapolis to the area of Galilee. Immediately, he was confronted by Pharisees. He had left there to get away from them, and guess what? As soon as he goes back, what happens? Mark 8, 11 to 13. Some Pharisees came to Jesus and started to argue with him. They wanted to trap him, so they asked him to perform a miracle to show that God approved of him. But Jesus gave a deep groan. He's into the groaning now, isn't he? <laughs> and said, why did the people this day ask for a miracle? No, I tell you, no such proof will be given to these people. He left them, got back into the boat, and started across the other side of the lake. Wow. As they were leaving Galilee and headed back to Decapolis, for Decapolis in their boat, Jesus took advantage of the opportunity to teach some very important lessons. Mm. Gordon, I think that must be you. Or, it was Jennifer, sorry. Uh, Mark 8, chapters 14, I mean, verses 14 to 21. The disciples had forgotten to bring enough bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. And those loaves were pretty small in those days, okay? Take care, Jesus warned them, and be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They started discussing among themselves. He says this because we haven't any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he asked them, 
Why are you discussing about not having any bread? Don't you know or understand yet? Are your minds so dull? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 people? How many baskets full of leftover pieces did you take up? Twelve, they answered. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000 people, asked Jesus, how many baskets full of leftover pieces did you take up? Seven, they answered. And you still don't understand, he asked them. Well, Matthew adds, in, on the, in this story, Matthew 16, 12, then the disciples understood that he was not warning them to guard against, to guard themselves from the yeast used in bread, but from the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Jesus was disappointed after feeding 5,000 men plus women and children from two fish and five small loaves of bread. They still thought he was concerned <clears throat> about not having physical food with them. I mean, did any of them think the creator of all things is here in the boat? <laughs> you know? Well, well, that was special. That was Jews that they were discussing there with the 5,000. Oh. Well, but later they, he also de dealt with well, 4,000 Gentiles. to that. Yeah. <laughs> what would you have done with the disciples at that point in time? Surely they must have at least begun to understand that their physical limitations were not limitations for Jesus. And then read Mark 8, 1, and we're not going to have time to do that, but that, of course, is a story about the feeding of the 4,000. Um, the 4,000 Gentiles. 4,000 Gentiles, not counting women and children, mm. um, which we discussed in our last lesson. Remember the seven baskets of food left over from those seven loaves and few small fish. Some people try to say this is just one story and they just repeated it to make it more impressive. But no, every detail of these two stories is different. I mean, obviously, it's, they fed a lot of people with small, a different amount of loaves, different amount of fish, and not only the, the baskets. And when, he, when they were dealing with, with the, with the uh, Jews, they used Jewish baskets. And when they do with the Gentiles, a very distinctly different size, time, kind of basket that was a Gentile basket. So it's not the same. And Mark mentions them sequentially. Yes. He wouldn't do it that way if it was. Do we need the warning against the sin of hypocrisy as much as the Pharisees, the Pharisees did? Yep. Hmm. In a word. Yes. From Ellen White's Desire of Ages. Among the, among the followers of our Lord today, as of old, how widespread is this subtle, deceptive sin that is the sin of hypocrisy? How often our service to Christ, our communion with one another, is marred by the secret desire to exalt self. How ready the thought of self-gratulation hmm. and the longing for human approval. Do we even have people who sometimes congratulate themselves, even would like to have some mission thing done and have their name put on it? Wonder. Now, now you've gone to meddling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is the love, continuing, it is the love of self, the desire for an easier way than God has appointed that leads to the substitution of human theories and traditions for the divine precepts. To his own disciples, the warning words of Christ are spoken take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The religion of Christ is sincerity itself. Zeal for God's glory is the motive implanted by the Holy Spirit, and only the effectual working of the Spirit can implant this motive. Let me interrupt for again for a second. Do you remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? They may see your good works and do what? Praise God. Glorify you, the Father in heaven, yeah. How many of us do things and, and people actually respond by thanking God for what, what's happened? Well, but we hmm. want them to thank us. Well, there's a problem with that. that okay. Dabbled in, in self-centeredness? What? <laughs> you think so? Continuing with Ellen okay. White, only the power of God can banish self-seeking and hypocrisy. This change is the sign of his working. 
when the faith we accept destroys selfishness and pretense, when it leads us to seek God's glory and not our own, we may know that it is of the right order. Father, glorify thy name, was from John 12, 28, was the keynote of Jesus's life, of Christ's life. And if we follow him, this will be the keynote of our life. He commands us to, quote, walk even as he walked, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. From Desire of Ages 409. Okay, we talk about that a lot. Um, do you anybody know of anybody who's practicing living like Jesus in 2024? You don't, you don't have to mention all the names you know. A few try, but they don't succeed. So is Jesus asking us to do something that's impossible here? Some people get a lot closer than others of us. Okay. Well, that, that's a comforting thought. Um, I mean, was what... It was it Philippians 2, 5? That this mind be in you is, yeah. is in Christ Jesus. You know, we learn to think like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, or like I quoted that uh, Matthew 19, verses 18 and 19, eternal life. What, what, and of course, John 17, 3 and 4, yeah. eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ who he sent. So what, man, that's a good start, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you, you, you can't fake, you know, you can't fake mercy. You can fake love, but you can't fake mercy. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? <laughs> sounds like sounds right. Haven't tried it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> think about think about what you would have done if you had been a disciple of Jesus on those occasions. Do you think you would have been able to sort out the truth and always be on the right side of every issue? Well, theology should be simple. You shouldn't need big thick books. You don't need the big thick books. Well, <laughs> go back to Matthew 19 there, the rich man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what are, what, are people, what are people driven by? Fear and greed. Okay, well, we talked about people who wanted to accomplish fame, power, and money. Those well, that's all self-centeredness. So, so yeah, that, that's, same. Uh, uh, it's not, not Philippians 2. Uh, that's not John 17, no. uh, 15 through 17, 18, what, 19. So what do we need to do to keep ourselves spiritually clean? Are there unclean people living in and around us? Would those be the people on Skid Row? Would those people be the homeless people sleeping in a tent or without even a tent? Here's the thought, might they be us? Us? No, it couldn't be us, could they? What percentage of those homeless people are there because of their lifestyle that they, that they have committed themselves yeah. to rather than yeah. t somebody else taking advantage of them? Uh, I think. Well, now the question is, how could we reach out to them? I mean, passing out money on the street corner when someone stands out there with a sign? That just reinforces their the direction, the false consequences. Remember that Jesus had just fed 4,000 men, not counting women and children, who were mostly Gentiles. According to the Jews, those people were outside of the realm of salvation. But they still needed food. Well, but, but it's salvation, let's put the words uh, healing. You know, if yeah, a yeah. sinful condition is, is a disease and you need healing, not forgiveness. Everybody gets forgiveness, whether they... Okay, now, we know that those religious leaders spent a great portion of their lives memorizing large portions of Scripture. Why, after doing all that, did they choose to place their traditions, human traditions, above the Scripture? Well, what did Paul do when he was held the coats for the uh, at the stoning of Stephen? Yeah, he, he had apparently had the memories uh, mm -hmm. down, but he hadn't put the thing into a model that made sense. Well, he certainly was able. To, he certainly changed, didn't he? Well, and it took him some time to do so. Yeah, 
I mean, he he got his attention there on the on the road, but he spent some serious several sure years. That, I'm he? sure that Stephen got his attention too by his speech. Mad magnificent sermon, wasn't it? Yeah. And really, what he was just quoting from from Amos. Yeah. <laughs> In the study of this portion of Mark, Jesus dealt with three clear challenges to the Jewish way of thinking. Could this have something to do with our way of thinking? Well, where are they? What are they? Jennifer, I think that's yours. Three ways of thinking. Three. Following G Isaiah 29, 13. Yes, the, okay. So Jesus dealt with three clear challenges to the Jewish way of thinking. Number one, following Isaiah 29, 13. He pointed out that they were just as bad as the people in Isaiah's day, doing things the way they wanted instead of God's way. Okay, their way instead of God's way. So none of we would never do anything like that, I'm sure. Number two, they had elevated their traditions above the teachings of Scripture. That's what we had just talked about a moment ago. And number three, in his healing of the deaf mute man, he was showing that he had the power to form and create human beings just as he did at creation. So what, think about this for a moment, okay? Here's someone walking around, look like a human being, but he's actually able to create worlds. Heal any disease, feed everybody. I mean, is it any surprise that the people who were interested in possibly having him to be king, I mean, what could possibly go wrong with that plan? At the time they were asking for that, remember that was the, the mother of, of was it John or whatever mm -hmm. says, hey, remember me, my, my sons, you know, okay. Everybody looking for a, a hierarchy, a, uh -huh. a, a, a pecking order. And of course, Jesus says, I call you friends. Now, how can you have a pecking order when, when and everybody's in, in a friendship if they're, relationship? If they're really, yeah, really friends, yeah. They don't just want a pecking order. They want to be at the top of the pecking yeah, order. Yeah, well, that's striving <laughs> up to that. But then they don't realize there's just somebody standing above them to putting their stamping on their feet as they try to climb the ladder. <laughs> in Isaiah's day also, yes. mere formality had taken over their religion. Can we read that? Let's see, where are we? Gordon? From Isaiah 1, starting with verse 2, the Lord said, Earth and sky, listen to what I am saying. The children I brought up have rebelled against me. Cattle know who owns them, and donkeys know where their master feeds them. But that is more than my people Israel know. They don't understand at all. Let me interrupt for just a Calling second. Them bullheaded. Yeah. What was going on in, in, in Isaiah's day? The northern kingdom of Israel had just been completely conquered and destroyed by the Assyrians. The enemies, their enemies, their mortal enemies are, what, 15 miles away. Well, wasn't most of Judah conquered then too? A lot of it was, a lot of it was. And, and you know, you, you would think, okay, something's not quite right here. What could it be? Hmm. Okay, go ahead. Verse four, you are doomed, you sinful nation, you corrupt and evil people. Your sins drag you down. You have rejected the Lord, the holy God of Israel, and have turned your backs on him. Why do you keep rebelling? Do you want to be punished even more? Israel, your head is already covered with wounds, and your heart and minds are sick. From head to foot, there is not a healthy spot on your body. You are covered with bruises and sores and open wounds. Your wounds have, been, have not been cleaned or bandaged. No ointment has been put on them. Jumping to verse nine, if the Lord Almighty had not let some of the people survive, Jerusalem would have been totally destroyed just as Sodom and Gomorrah were. Would it have been with a, a brimstone or would it have been? Mm, who knows? Maybe. Verse, verse 10, Jerusalem, your rulers and your people are like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to what the mm. Lord is saying to mm. you. Mm. Mm. Pay attention to what your God is teaching you. He says, do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me? I have had more than enough of the sheep you burn as sacrifices and of the fat of your fine animals. I am tired of the blood of bulls and sheep and goats. Does this sound like Leviticus? Well, if you read Leviticus correctly, probably. <laughs> okay. Who asked you to bring me all this when you come to worship me? And most of the people said, you did, God. Yeah. 
Who asked you to do all this tramping, tramping around in my temple? It's useless to bring your offerings. I am disgusted with the smell of the incense you burn. I cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths and your religious gatherings. How could the Sabbaths be in that group of things? Uh. They are all corrupted by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals and holy days. They are a burden that I am tired of bearing. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. Mm. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. The so what kind of cleanliness is Jesus talking, is Isaiah here talking about Character. on God's bed? He's talking about cleaning up your behavior, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Verse 18, the Lord says, now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin, but I will wash you as clean as snow. Although your stains are deep red, you will be as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will eat the good things the land produces from the Good News Bible. Mark 7 alludes to Isaiah 29, 13, which says in this chiasm, based on the translation by the author, notice this, these, and they love these chiasm things. A, people draw near to me with their mouths and lips. B, to honor me. C, but their hearts are far from me, the main point. And then B1, going back again, their reverence for me is like commandments repeated by rote. So you can see right within that verse, there's a chiasm. In regard to the issues in Isaiah and also in Mark, notice this commentator's thoughts. Um, I'll just go ahead and read because we're about out of time. As a sovereign it reviews uh, their worship, all he sees is conformity to human rules. It is not that the Lord belittles the use of words, but words without heart are meaningless and worship is not worship. Maybe you should just jump to the conclusion. Yeah, okay. Notice what another commentator said. Okay, people, this is down to. If you get a chance to look, look at this with your books. But anyway, imagine the disappointment of Jesus. He repeatedly came in contact with religious things. Okay, what can we conclude? Both in Isaiah's generation, the seventh century BC, and in Mark's generation, uh, in the first century, the worship of God's people is in vain because of their wrong emphasis and the hypercritical attitude of their hearts. In some sense, the Pharisees and the scribes are responsible for this condition because as leaders, they use their considerable uh, influence of the people to upon human traditions. So that's the way we've got, to, we've got to get rid of that. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for revealing these things to us, these hypocritical things that are so human, so obvious that we, they can slip in so easily to our behavior. We have examples clear from the Old Testament and even these examples that Jesus points out in the New Testament. That should be a clear warning to us. May it be so as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.